If you're just joining us, we welcome you to Mind Matters, the community mental health education event for NAMI Central Texas. Our event today is generally sponsored by Ascension Seton, and we are so grateful for their support. My name is Dr. Rebecca Farrell, and I am the Program and Outreach Director for NAMI Central Texas. We are excited to have you here with us today as we learn about postpartum depression and the support that's available in our communities. We are joined by Melissa Bentley from the Postpartum Support International. Welcome, Melissa. I'll turn it over to you for an introduction and presentation. Great, thank you so much. I really appreciate your time. Um, and I appreciate your invitation to be here today. Uh, this is a topic that I live and breathe, <laughs> and um, I'm really passionate about supporting anyone that's struggling with this and, and helping to make sure that people understand um, and, and kind of, um, <clears throat> yeah, sorry, it, it's, uh, there, there's a lot of misunderstandings, and I'm really excited to be able to, to help uh, clarify a lot of things. So um, my name is Melissa Bentley. I'm a licensed professional counselor in Austin, Texas. Um, I am also a perinatal mental health certified. That's the, the other part of the alphabet after my name, um, which means that I have um, additional training and um, experience. And then I jumped through some hoops and I uh, took an exam to get those initials. But this is my, my area of expertise and I'm really excited to share. So I am actually on staff with Postpartum Support International. Um, we are a largely volunteer-based organization that um, provides resources and information and peer support, um, as well as training. I'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, but I manage the coordinator program for the United States and Canada. And so that's why I have this big map behind me. Um, I am also the president of a local nonprofit called Pregnancy and Postpartum Health Alliance of Texas, or PPHA for short. And we provide kind of more local resources and support and um, opportunities to uh, for individuals, especially that are unable to afford care to receive the help that they need um, so they can get back to being the person that they want to be um, and the parent that they want to be. Um, so without further ado, I shall move on. So um, just as a note, um, the, the chat is open, but I'm not going to be paying attention to it just because I want to make sure I cover as much of this as I can. But later, absolutely, I would love to answer questions um, and I will do my best to um, monitor the time to, to leave at least 15 to 20 minutes. Uh, so starting with this, I, I invite each and every one of you to set aside any thoughts or kind of um, uh, beliefs and under, you know, thoughts that you have that about postpartum depression and just kind of um, be willing to consider that there might be more to the story than you realize. Um, first of all, the media doesn't always take the time to get the story straight. Um, there's a, one, uh, a, one reporter from a local news station um, had reached out on Facebook to a whole bunch of uh, people saying that she was going to do a story about postpartum depression. And I reached out as, as did many of my colleagues and said, oh, please let me at least, you know, give you a foundation understanding so you can make sure that you're using correct information. And she didn't. And her story didn't make any sense, you know, from the research standpoint and the understanding of, of, um, of the whole wide range. And it was really unfortunate. And that happens a lot. Um, also, the stories that we tend to hear about are the sensationalized ones, the ones that are often tragic, um, which does happen, but it's a much smaller subset. I'll talk about that as well. Um, but that makes it feel like it's more common. And unfortunately, a lot of times the media does not use the right terminology. So they'll, they'll call it postpartum depression when that's not actually what was happening. Um, also, well-meaning friends and family members, a lot of times they personally have had their own experience with maybe the baby blues, and they don't recognize that that's not the same thing. Um, I you know, I certainly, um, Seton Ascension is wonderful. And um, unfortunately, even the Shoal Creek website uh, inter, like kind of um, uses the, uh, the term baby blues for postpartum depression, which is not the same thing. And, um, and that causes a, you know, it perpetuates the problem. Um, also, many medical providers, including psychiatrists, don't have additional training in this area. And so um, they don't know, and they may kind of 
cause more delays in getting the help um, that, that their patients may need. Um, and then finally, Dr. Google is not always our friend. Um, there's often a lot of fear mongering. There is um, distraction about like, oh, you know, if it's just a hormonal thing, if it's just a um, nutrition deficit, like, and those may be elements, but it's not the cause. So we're going to talk about that as well. So join me in this journey and, um, and I'm excited for you to come away with it with a better understanding. So first of all, as I get my thing to work, there we go. It is not the baby blues. Okay. The baby blues is up to two weeks. It is a time period it is two weeks after giving birth. It's usually starts within the first three to five days or so it can start soon, but it's time limited and it goes away by itself. It is not a mental health diagnosis. It actually makes a lot of sense with um, the, you know, the physical changes that happen, the exhaustion that happens towards the end of pregnancy, labor, delivery. Um, you know, a lot of it is like, you know, kind of you, we think about uh, mental health in the biopsychosocial kind of realm. And so there are a lot of things going on after giving birth. Um, it can be, uh, you know, kind of navigating the challenges of having family members wanting to come and hold the baby. And you're not really sure if you feel comfortable, especially during times of COVID and a pandemic of like, do we feel comfortable with those family members coming in and holding the baby and kissing on the baby and things like that? Or, you know, there might be family dynamics going on that cause extra complications. And, um, you know, it's really important that we, you know, recognize that that's going to impact the mental health of that person um, and, and the stress level. So it's, um, it, it's, it's kind of complicated, but it's not depression. It's not the actual... Um, you know, a mental health diagnosis. So the home, and I'll show a graph about this in a little bit, but the hormonal fluctuation during pregnancy that helps to lead up to childbirth is, and then right after childbirth is enormous. And it makes sense that that would be an, a big impact. And typically it get it, it kind of settles down after a couple of, like within about two weeks. And it, we find that as the parent starts to kind of the sleep starts to improve, um, they're able to find a routine. They're able to kind of, you know, settle into this new structure of their life. It tends to kind of things start to calm down and get back to normal. But if the difficulty began during pregnancy or after two weeks, or it lasts longer than two weeks, that's what I want to pay attention to. So postpartum, and a lot of people will say, oh, she has postpartum or I had postpartum. Well, postpartum is a period of time. So it's not an actual diagnosis or a, a disorder. Um, it is the, the year after childbirth, one up to one year. So difficulties with mental health that we are concerned, we're concerned with, and you'll see towards the bottom, we prefer using the term perinatal, which means pregnancy and the first year postpartum. Uh, so often the difficulties do begin during pregnancy and it is something that can be blown off. Like, well, of course you're exhausted. You're in your third trimester of pregnancy. Like makes sense. You don't want to get out of bed. Well, if she's not getting out of bed because she's just absolutely exhausted and very depressed, we need to really pay attention to that because maybe she's not eating. Maybe she's not getting the, you know, kind of moving her body the way that it needs to, to, to feel okay, that she, it may be kind of perpetuating itself. Um, also, I hear a lot of times, well, you know, I, I was really anxious during the pregnancy, but people kept telling me it makes sense. It's normal to be anxious or worried when you're pregnant. But if that anxiety is actually moving into the, you know, kind of into the realm of um, causing dysfunction in that person's life, then we need to pay attention to this. Um, so again, the onset can be anytime during the first year, but it also can be during pregnancy. More often than not, the onset begins around three to four months. Um, it might be correlated with a sleep regression that happens around that time, but it also may just be, yeah, you know, there may be other things at play. And I'll talk about in a bit that there's not one cause. And so it's really important to recognize that as well, um, that there might be multiple factors involved. Um, also, this is one that those of us that do this work recognize this and, and see it in action, um, but it doesn't actually fit what DSM says, what the Diagnostic Statistical Manual says, um, which is what often is used for diagnosis. Um, and that is that it can happen years later. 
So in the cases of individuals that are doing extended breastfeeding or chest feeding, um, it can actually, the onset can be years later, especially if there's an abrupt discontinuation um, with weaning. So that's something to keep in mind as well. Um, and those cases are often blown off. Um, I've even had, I've had moms reach out that have said like, oh, my doctor said that I'm, you know, my baby's 15 months now, so it can't be postpartum. And what I'll say is, well, when did it actually start? When did you start struggling? And most often they'll say, oh, about four months or something like that. And I'll say four months, you're 15 months postpartum now. So you've been struggling for 11 months. Like, I'm so sorry. Let's get you some help. Like, let, yes, this counts. As long as the onset was during that either pregnancy or one year postpartum, that counts. Okay. So it's also not just depression. It can be, and it often is, in fact, you know, kind of, the numbers are not great, and I'll explain that in a bit, but the anxiety part is, you know, almost more prevalent than depression. But as we often know, depression, let's see if my video shows, um, depression and anxiety often go very much hand in hand. So sometimes it can be hard to distinguish the two, and it kind of doesn't matter if it's causing disruption, let's get that person some help. So depression and anxiety are probably the most two, the two that are the most common. I mentioned that the, the research and the numbers are not great, and that's because the questions that are being asked on a lot of the research projects in the past have not been as that have not been as all encompassing to be able to get really good data. And so, you know, we see numbers like one in seven versus one in five, um, 20%, like all of those can be true based on what the, the questions were that were asked. But when you, when the research studies are looking for depression and anxiety and pretty much this whole gamut of experiences, the numbers are higher for sure. So if we're just looking at depression, it might be more like one in seven, but if we're acknowledging the rest of these possible um, experiences, the numbers tend to be higher. So it can be depression, it can be anxiety, it can be PTSD, and that could be from a history of childhood sexual abuse, it could be from a difficult pregnancy, it can be from, you know, goodness, sexual assault. It can be from um, maybe there was a emergency C-section and maybe the baby spent time in the NICU or, you know, there could be many different things going on. Um, <clears throat> and that can come up later. Um, also obsessive compulsive disorder. And I'll talk about this a little bit more. Um, that definitely can come up. And then bipolar disorder. Um, one of my colleagues was telling me that the the most common time for a woman to be diagnosed with bipolar disorder is during the reproductive period. And so we can extrapolate some ideas and some thoughts on that, that it might be that, and, and what, what often is seen is that it might be during the postpartum period, because perhaps it is set off by, well, there are a lot of different possibilities, but it could be that it's set off by the sleep deprivation that happens during postpartum um, with a new baby, or it could be that it was, you know, absolutely from some hormonal fluctuation um, that set things off, or it could be that they did go see their OB and they asked for um, an antidepressant because they were experiencing just depressive symptoms and it might be presenting as a unipolar depression, but without having done a good, um, uh, a good, um, family history to really understand the bigger picture, they may have missed that there is a family history of bipolar disorder and putting an individual on an antidepressant who actually has an underlying bipolar disorder can bring about and often, well, I'm, I'm not sure the numbers, but it absolutely can lead to a manic phase. So it might be that the first time that this person has experienced a manic phase is as a result. Um, again, you'll see in my, my, <laughs> one graphic here that baby blues, I don't care about it. It doesn't fit. It's not part of the, the oval here of actual mood or anxiety disorders. I care about it if it lasts longer than two weeks. And if it is causing such disruption, then of course, like that it's, it's, um, causing difficulty with functioning, then yeah, we want to look at it, but in itself, it's not as much my concern. Now over here, postpartum psychosis, I put this separately because postpartum depression does not lead to postpartum psychosis. It is its own distinct experience. Um, unfortunately in the DSM, it is not listed. Um, there is a cert, a, uh, oh goodness, what is it? A, um, an online petition, uh, that, that, um, 
has been circulating recently to make postpartum psychosis its own diagnosis. But right now it's kind of those of us that do this work really understand the difference. And postpartum psychosis is its own thing. And I'll talk about that a bit as well. It is considered to be a psychiatric emergency. And this one can is only at this point believed to be only the birth giving individual. So, all right, next. So I, yeah, so to, to go a little further, I said later, here it is. Um, so on the OCD part, it is very common, and this happens a lot, that individuals may experience what we call intrusive thoughts. So these are unwanted, undesired thoughts, images, and ideas that can pop into the person's head and can be very distressing and very upsetting. They may or may not be paired with a compulsive behavior. So it may not be a full-blown OCD. It might just be the O part. Um, it's sometimes um, it's sometimes called pure O, but it's the idea is that that person might have a thought, and I'm careful not to kind of suggest what those thoughts are because I don't want anybody walking away going, oh yeah, or if they're um, prone to having these thoughts, I don't want them to be like, oh, their brain thinking, yeah, that's a good one. I'm going to stress about that. But these might be thoughts often about bad things happening to the baby or to someone in the family, or even themselves. And that can be really confusing because if they have a thought or an intrusive thought of something bad happening to them, it might feel like they may have never had a feeling or a thought of, you know, suicidality before. And this felt like, oh my gosh, now all of a sudden I'm suicidal. Well, it may not be that. It might just be that they, their brain is, um, kind of making, not making, but, um, thinking about something that is very distressing and it might be about them harming themselves. The way I often describe this um, to the, the parents that I work with is it's your brain on overdrive, thinking of everything that could possibly go wrong so you can try to prevent it. So it's preventative. It, you know, if it's about the baby, it shows how much you love the baby because a lot of times the parent will be walking, you know, having these thoughts and they think, oh my gosh, like, does this mean I don't love my baby? Or does this mean, wow, this I'm a terrible parent that I'm having these thoughts. And so there's a lot of shame and a lot of anxiety that comes with it. Um, it can be very distressing. And a lot of times the parents don't want to talk about it. And so they don't bring it up and they don't, they don't mention it to anybody else. And then they don't have the opportunity to find out that they're not the only one and that this is actually very common. So um, a lot of times I like to make sure that I just, I work it into the conversations just to let people know. Um, it could be about a family member. I know when my husband, when my babies were when my kids were little, they're much older now, middle and high school. But when my kids were little, um, my husband traveled a lot and I used to have some intrusive thoughts about him, you know, being in a plane crash or, you know, something really bad happening. It certainly wasn't that I wanted that to happen or, you know, that, that it wasn't really serving a purpose other than in my mind, kind of my mind thinking like, okay, that's something that, that could happen. So I need to be vigilant and think about like what, and there was nothing I could do to prevent that from happening. But um, as far as like a baby possibly being harmed, like it might increase my desire. Like for some people, it might be a thought of dropping the baby or something bad happening. And so they might become even more vigilant and careful about um, where they hold the baby or where they walk around with the baby. So these are things um, that can end up um, impacting their behaviors as well. And that might move into the OCD part or with the compulsion. And then finally, it's really important to keep in mind that these intrusive thoughts are what we call ego dystonic. It, that means it does not fit with what, um, it doesn't match with the person's character or who they feel they are. So this is not psychosis. It doesn't, it, it feels outside of them, which also can kind of feel like it's outside of them and it's like some other force or something, you know, if they've never experienced any kind of mental health difficulty like this before, it can feel like, oh my goodness, I'm, you know, I'm, it might feel like psychosis, but it's really important to realize um, postpartum psychosis tends to happen very early. Um, it happens, it tends to happen 48 hours to two weeks after giving birth. I have had nurses from um, one local hospital that have called me to say, I'm kind of worried about this mom that I've got in, um, in recovery. Like, you know, she seems to like, she's showing these certain signs and, you know, kind of, we talked about it and talked about what to look for and what to talk to the family about. Um, it often will resemble a manic or a mixed episode 
with confusion and disorientation, disorganized behavior, but it can often come and go. And so it can be kind of confusing. So it might be that um, <clears throat> the family members, like everything seems fine. And then one day they happen to see their, you know, their online search history and realize, wait a minute, what is going on? Like, why, you know, I'm trying not to divulge like specific cases that I've helped with, but, you know, like maybe all of a sudden the person is um, researching, you know, international travel or something that doesn't make sense and doesn't really fit with what's going on with their life. Um, these things make sense to that person though. And that's where it gets to be a little bit concerning um, because they may hide it to themselves. Like, you know, in some cases it might be, there's one woman who does a um, kind of a one woman show about her experience um, called playing Monopoly with God. And she was in Montana. I think this was probably about 10 years ago. And she shared that she really believed that she could walk through walls. Like it made sense to her. I can walk through these walls. Like, why do we even have these walls? It's, we can just walk straight across the house. It's great. If she were to walk through a wall herself, she might bump her nose. She might, you know, get a bruise on her forehead. Then like something might be, you know, it would impact her. But the problem is what if she started to do that while holding the baby, she could actually harm her baby. So she wouldn't mean to harm the baby. That wasn't her intention, but that could happen because her, dis her delusions were confusing and not making sense. And, and she wasn't thinking clearly about the harm that could, could come from that. Um, the story that a lot of us have heard about is um, Andrea Yates in um, Clear Lake back in 2001. She truly believed that the devil was coming after her children. And so she really believed every core fiber of her being believed that she was saving them by sending them to heaven first. And unfortunately, that did result in the demise of her five children. Um, she is now in a minimum security prison in Colleen and, or no, Kerrville. And she, is on medication. She's completely like able to function just fine. And she's dealing with the grief of knowing of the harm that she caused. Um, but a lot of people looked at her husband and said that he, poor man, he lost his wife and his children. Well, he was told not to leave her alone. And he was told she needed to take her medication. And he said, she just needs to get over it. So, um, Anyway, we're going to move on. So um, I, my soapbox, sometimes it's hard for me not to get on it, but um, I caught myself there. So individuals with postpartum psychosis, many of them have not had any kind of history with psychiatric dis dysfunction or difficulty. Um, one and two will develop postpartum psychosis if they have a history of... Um, or of the women who develop postpartum psychosis and don't have a history, perhaps there's um, themselves, a, then maybe there's a family history with postpartum psychosis or bipolar disorder. Um, so of the individuals, and it's, I didn't have this number in here and I really should have, the, the rate of occurrence is one or two out of every thousand live births. So it happens. It is not completely rare, but of those cases, only there's a very small percentage that do harm their baby. So of those cases, it's, and um, the, we're concerned about the infanticide, but again, it's not generally like malice or anger or, um, you know, it's usually out of harm to the baby, not realizing. And occasionally there is a case where their delusion is that the baby is the devil or the baby is, there's something wrong, but those are things that's not their personal belief. And it's not a personal shortcoming. It is psychosis. It is a, a mental illness that needs to be treated. Um, and we're more likely going to see them harming themselves. So we need to really pay attention and look at this and, and pay attention to these individuals. Okay. So back to my, my theory or my theme of it is not just the baby blues. It's also not just moms. So um, it can and absolutely does get um does get experienced. Yes, we'll say that does get experienced or can be experienced by dads, same sex partners, adoptive parents, grandparents, and caregivers. I did a presentation last year for, um, uh, DFS, um, department of, uh, family services. I'm trying to remember which it was a small group of, um, of the individuals that do, um, kind of, uh, they meet with caregivers that have been, you know, maybe have taken in a family member or somebody else. And they were finding a, 
they requested this training because they were finding that many of the caregivers that they were um, engaging with did have um, symptoms of depression or anxiety. And so it, it absolutely can happen. Um, there, the research, if I say the research on the exact numbers of depression and anxiety are limited, let me just tell you the numbers for dads and same-sex partners is even less um, just because there's not really a lot of research being done into this, but the best we can tell from the research that's out there and the you know, meta-analysis that we've done is that it's believed that up to 10% of dads experience postpartum depression or anxiety. And I will tell you that absolutely tracks with the what we're, what we're seeing with Postpartum Support International. Um, it is out there, they just often don't talk about it. Also, it is believed that up to 50% of dads who have a partner who is struggling with um, depression or anxiety, that up to 50% of them are experiencing this. Um, I started a support group six years ago in Austin and can't tell you how many times the conversation in our group has turned to um, their partners and the, the mental health of their partners and how their partners are struggling as well. So it Again, it also very much tracks. Um, the only exception is with um, that whole system of, of different um, disorders and illnesses is um, postpartum psychosis. As of right now, the research shows that it is just the birth giving parent or the mom who experiences this. Um, there is some research being done to look into possibly if dads might be experiencing that um, during shaken, like in events that result in maybe shaken baby syndrome. Um, but the research is just not sufficient yet. So at this point, it's believed that only moms can experience the postpartum psychosis. All righty. So, um, and the next part is it's not just hormones. You know, I, I hear that a lot too. Like, I'm sure it's just my hormones and it'll get better. Well, for baby blues, that might level itself out. And for some people, there is a um, increased sensitivity to um, hormonal fluctuations, and that can be an element. Um, but the reality is, during pregnancy, the um, the progesterone and estrogen levels rises, and that's necessary to maintain the pregnancy and to prepare for um, for the birth. And so, what you see at this point is. Um, the parturition is, or parturition is the, the birth. And then that is the, um, at the point of the expelling of the placenta. So when the, the placenta is delivered, the hormonal level just absolutely plummets and it, it goes down. And so with such a huge, <clears throat> excuse me, fluctuation like that, it actually makes a lot of sense that, that that could be impactful for mental health or at least the, the mood and um, the mental state of, of parents. And it, it takes some fluctuation. And I, I recall from my own per personal postpartum experiences, like, um, you know, just my body felt like everything, like things were changing and that was, it was, it was awkward and it was strange and it just felt different and weird. And, um, you know, while I was excited to have my baby, I was also like, what is happening with this body? Cause it's, things were changing so much. Um, and that's normal. That's, that's common. That, that is experienced by very many of the parents after they give birth. Um, but it's important to realize that it's, that does level itself off, like usually within a, a couple of weeks. And so after that, that's really not a causal factor of postpartum depression or anxiety, or what we call perinatal mood and anxiety disorders. So again, the significant reactions to the hormonal fluctuations, um, you know, again, we talked about biopsychosocial and some of on the next three slides, you'll see some of them kind of overlap a little bit, but you know, if an individual has a history with their mood changing quite a bit with puberty, if they tended to get um, PMDD or premenstrual dysphoric disorder, um, hormonal birth control, maybe with a past pregnancy loss or something and see that their, their mood and their like, um, was strongly impacted by, um, hormonal fluctuations that absolutely can be a contributing factor, but that's not the case for everyone. Um, as a local OB told me once a few years ago, we were chatting about this and she said, if it was just hormones, we would test every single 
mom after she gave birth and then like at their, you know, two week or six week appointment. And we would be able to tell which ones are experiencing postpartum depression and we'd be able to treat it, but it doesn't work that way. It is not that consistent. Um, so going back to other biological factors, complications in pregnancy or birth, either real or perceived, if they thought something was not right and not going on, that can lead to an experience of trauma. And we have to acknowledge that that is not necessarily, you know, going to be what's on their medical chart, but if that was their experience that can set off, um, set the stage for, for further difficulties, health issues in the mother, like diabetes, thyroid, infertility, that could be factor, um, causal factors or contributing factors. I, I try not to say causes because there tend to be multiple factors at play, um, health issues in the baby, either during pregnancy, or if the baby was in the NICU, that's a big one. I started the NICU support group for PSI about two and a half years ago, um, because my second was in the NICU and just the need for that extra support is, is enormous. It, that experience is, is very isolating. Um, and there's also another local organization hand to hold that does great support groups and provides excellent support for NICU parents, um, parents of multiples. Oh my goodness. The amount of stress that is involved. It's yeah, they, <laughs> that can be a definite contributing factor, difficulty with chest, breast, or body feeding and weaning. Um, also the pressures that people are putting on, that's more about the social part. And again, the real or perceived trauma. So bio psycho, so psychological family history of depression, anxiety, bipolar disorder, eating disorders, or OCD, whether these things have been diagnosed or not major life changes, moving career change, death, divorce, all of those things can be a major factor. If the pregnancy was unwanted or unexpected, even if in the end, they're happy to have that baby, that like jarring of like, wait, this is not the time. Like we weren't planning on this happening right now. Like that can absolutely be a contributing factor. Um, but not for everybody, for some people, oh, this is wonderful. I'm blessed. This is the way it's supposed to happen. But for other people that might not be such the same experience, um, difficulty again with breast, best, uh, breasts, chest, I'm trying to make them all into one word, breast, chest, or body feeding, um, the trauma history of loss or infertility can absolutely contribute. Um, perfectionism. I see this a lot. Um, parents that are just, they want to be perfect. They want to have everything look just right. They're trying to keep up with their friends on Instagram and make sure that, like their house looks great. It's just, that's too much pressure. Um, substance use or a history of substance use and trying to maintain that, um, sobriety or, you know, the challenges during the postpartum period. And then also just not feeling Feeling bonded with baby. I'm going to let you in on a little secret. The idea that every parent feels immediately bonded with their baby upon birth is not true. Like that's not a reality. That's not something that we should expect to happen. And what's really sad is when a parent has their baby and maybe they're just in shock about what just happened, um, whether it's the birth giving parent or their partner, like if they're not looking at that baby and just automatically feeling the sense of like one of those Pampers commercials of like, Oh, I'm so in love with my baby. They may have this thought of like, what is wrong with me? I've been wanting to have this baby forever. And now I'm not like this excited, like from the very first moments, they're feeling like they're a terrible parent. But the reality is for some people, it takes a little time and that's okay. But if they go into it feeling from the very beginning of their baby's life, you know, on the outside that there's something wrong with them. That's a terrible way to start. And, um, I've definitely talked to many parents that that kind of set the ball rolling for feeling like they were not the parent that they wanted to be. Okay. So, uh, social, there are so many factors here as well, and we really can't, we really need to acknowledge these and really, um, honor them, but by POC parents, the, the challenge that the challenges that they are experiencing, during the pregnancy, I don't need to get in. Well, maybe I don't know if your group is um, well familiar with the um, maternal mortality rates um, in Texas. It's a cause for concern. There's an alarm. We need to pay attention to this and the the care that they're getting during pregnancy and postpartum. Need to pay attention to the stress that that's causing. Um, ma again, major life changes, socially negated pregnancy. This might be you know, a person who chooses to have to be a single parent, um, either a teenage or later or whenever that maybe the people around them aren't supportive of. So that can cause extra stress, inadequate emotional or practical support, either from their community or their family members. This became a bigger issue during COVID. It really has, has, um, 
ramped up and amped up the, the level of stress in parents. Um, I've definitely seen that across the country. Um, high stress environment, lack of safety, insecure housing, um, domestic violence, emotional abuse. Um, domestic violence tends to increase during pregnancy. Um, and so that's something that we kind of keep an ear, op ear open for when we're talking to new parents, financial stress, marital stress, immigrants, um, military families, LGBTQ plus families. That's um, the ability to find other families that can show like, yes, this is how you can be a successful same-sex couple and you can have, you know, raise a child and um, not going to get on my, my, um, soapbox on this one, but you know, the, the amount of pressure that's, that's out there, that's not, um, adequately addressed. Um, and, and the feeling of isolation, that's, that's huge. Um, same, same for dads and non-birthing partners. They often feel like they're, everyone's paying attention to the birth giving parent, but not to them. And, um, their needs feel like they're being left out. So quickly going through treatment options, support groups. I'm a huge fan of support groups. If you've got an individual that's like, oh, I can't go to therapy because therapy, they just mess with your mind. A support group might be a great place to see modeling and see other people that, oh, she's just like me and have, you know, having the same problems that I am. And, oh, she just talked about going to therapy. Huh? Maybe I can go to therapy and they might hear what therapy is really like. And then that opens up the, the possibility for them to consider that maybe therapy could be helpful for them. Same thing with medication. So I usually, when I'm talking to someone that's struggling, I will suggest support groups as a first step. And if they're open to it, then therapy and counseling, that can be individual group. Um, it, it's harder to have group therapy that is um, for postpartum mental health, just because it's it, it can be harder to kind of arrange all the, the, the variables on that one. Um, Intensive outpatient programs, we don't have any in Texas that are really good for, I mean, there's one in Houston. Um, we don't have any that are specifically designed for pregnant and postpartum patients. And that's something that uh, I have a colleague up in Dallas that's working on that too. And I had tried to work with a local hospital here and that didn't work out, but um, they do exist in other parts of the country. Um, and hopefully Texas will have one, um, I'm hoping. Um, help with, ta with tasks and reducing stress. Like, you know, when family members are saying, Hey, how can I help you? Like give them a task. Or like, if they say, if you need anything, let me know. We'll say, great. Can you come over and do some laundry or great? Can you bring me dinner tomorrow night? Or, you know, like be specific and, and it's okay to ask for help. Um, having a postpartum doula can be incredibly helpful, especially one that's trained and understands mental health concerns and can kind of know like, that's something you might want to talk to a therapist about, um, or just to be there and listen. Of course, psychiatric medications. There are a few medications that are contraindicated during pregnancy and while um, breastfeeding, but most medications at this point, we can't do the awesome double blind studies of like, okay, you pregnant people take this medication and you pregnant people don't, and let's see how it goes. But at this point, enough people have taken medications while pregnant and breastfeeding that we have good knowledge of which medications are considered to be safe. Um, a lot of times people will be prescribed Zoloft, which is a fine medication, but it might not be the best one. Um, a lot of times OBs are told like, oh yeah, Zoloft, it's got the, the smallest amount that goes through the breast milk. It's, you know, 98% protein bound and that's great, but it might be better by 0.0002%. And so another medication might be a better fit for that individual. So there are psychiatrists that have specialized training and actually the Austin area, we are super lucky. We have a ton, like we have at least five reproductive psychiatrists that really know what they're doing. And they're very comfortable prescribing medication. They tend to take longer with their patients to really help them understand and feel okay with treatment options. Um, psychiatric hospitalization as well is just not awesome. There are two, maybe three programs across the country that have specific hospitalized or hospital programs inpatient for perinatal mental health. But even those, it's usually a few beds that are associated with, you know, a general psych floor, and it's not always the best fit. Um, one is at UNC Chapel Hill. They do some, some really good stuff there, but it kind of depends on how many people are there. Um, and uh, there's one in El 
El Camino, I think in California, there's another one in Chicago that I think is an IOP. So there are a few and that's listed on the, the postpartum.net website. Okay, medication, I'm not gonna go through all of this, but the main thing to keep in mind, especially when you have a pregnant or postpartum parent is that they may have concerns about taking medication. And so it's really important that they have somebody they can talk to. <clears throat> Excuse me, there is a website, and I forgot to send this to you um, to, to share here, but it's um, mothertobaby.org is a fantastic website. They have um, fact sheets about different medications, and they have genetic counselors that will talk to you um, to do a chat to talk about it. Um, let's see. Okay, I'm going to keep going. So what do you think, it, what do you do if it's an emergency? So I'm thinking in the case of um, a psychosis type situation, um, first of all, know your lane. Know that this may not, you may not be the most appropriate person to fix what's going on or to take care of things, but what you can do is make sure that that parent is not alone um, and not alone with their child. Because if they are experiencing signs of, and symptoms of psychosis, we want to make sure that they are safe and that their baby is safe. So um, in the Austin area, we would reach out to the mobile crisis outreach team and make sure that they know, unless, unless this person has a, um, a psychiatrist, in which case we would want to reach out to them and try to get an emergency appointment and get them kind of stabilized as soon as possible. Um, certainly Shoal Creek, I've, um, I have kind of helped a couple of moms get admitted to, or at least connected to people that can get them admitted to Shoal Creek to get the kind of, um, you know, kind of emergency um, attention that they need. Um, but again, the, the most important, and, and in the Austin area, the Dell ER, they do have psychiatrists on, um, um, uh, on rounds that do have this good knowledge. And so that's a really good place to go. Uh, that's where I would normally send somebody. Um, but this is not something really that you want to just kind of wait out and see and, and hope that it gets better if it is more of an emergency. Um, and I see there are some questions in the chat. I'll get there. Let's see. Culturally sensitive strategies. I want to make sure I get to some other things. Most important thing is I like to tell people let's commonize their experience rather than normalize. Because if you tell somebody, oh, that's normal to feel tired or depressed after you have a baby. Instead, I think it's really, it's much more impactful to say, you know, this is really common and this happens to a lot of people. Let's get you some help. It's much more hopeful because if you tell someone, oh, that's normal, then it's kind of like, then get over it, like move on. It's important, I think, um, and I didn't mention this before, but it's believed that 50 to 85% of all women have experienced the baby blues, of women that have had babies have experienced the baby blues. So that is really common, but they don't always realize the baby blues is not the same thing as postpartum depression. And so it's very common that I will hear somebody say, well, my sister keeps telling me that she had this and she just had to take a long shower and then she was fine. And I'll, you know, I'll say, well, your baby is five months old. Have you tried taking a shower since your baby was born or since you started to struggle? And, you know, they'll kind of laugh and it depends on my rapport with the person, but they'll laugh and say, well, yeah. And I'll say, well, did it help? Did it fix it? No. Well, I'll say, I don't know your sister. I wasn't there, but my guess would be if a shower made it all better, she was probably experiencing the baby blues and she probably doesn't realize that what you have is probably not the same thing. So whatever it is, let's get you some help because I want her to be able to advocate for herself and to realize that it's not, um, that, that it's okay, that what her experience may not be the same as somebody else's and, you know, their experience and what worked for them may not work for her. So, um, let's see. So again, help them to, uh, connect with resources and support. Um, there are therapists that have specific training, um, whether they are perinatal mental health certified or not. Um, Austin has a great set of resources and I'll get to that very shortly. Um, encourage that parent to connect with other parents, which is really hard during a pandemic, especially when, um, you know, there are concerns about the baby not being, um, you know, having immunity to COVID and to, to other things. So, Again, asking for specific help is good. Um, reminding them sometimes it can be really helpful to remind them that this is a short period of time. The babies grow so quickly. You think about their clothes, zero to three months, three to six months, six to nine months, nine to 12 months, 12 to 18, hmm, slows down, 18 to 24, then 2T, 3T. Like there's a massive amount of change that happens in that first year and even the second year. And so it's really important to kind of keep that into perspective but we don't want to blow anybody off. So let's see, keep them going. We have to keep in mind that 
there is a lot of misunderstanding and there are people that are told, oh, you're depressed and you have a baby. You don't want to tell anybody because they might take your baby away. In some communities, that is a valid concern. Um, and in some areas where they don't know the difference, that absolutely is a possibility. That did happen in Sacramento a couple of years ago to a mom who actually asked her, like was talking to the nurse practitioner at her OB's office. And instead of actually talking to her and figuring out what she needed, they called the police and had her escorted to an emergency room for evaluation. And after like eight hours in the emergency room, um, they released her and they were like, here's a list of therapists to call. If they had called one of the volunteers in my program, the volunteer would have hooked that woman up with all the resources she needed and helped her get what she needed in the right and pointed in the right direction. So there are a lot of reasons why people are avoidant to getting the help that they need. Um, okay. So I'm going to keep going locally resources are pregnancy and postpartum health Alliance of Texas, pphatx.org. We have a provider directory of individuals that we have vetted and we check with them um, at least every six months to make sure that their information is still correct and accurate. Um, we offer trainings for professionals and community members. We, you know, offer trainings for postpartum doulas to help them be more knowledgeable and understanding. And then finally, we have programs for local parents, parents in the local area who can't afford the care that they need. We have a psychiatric voucher program and a therapy voucher program. And postpartum support international. Um, we, there's a lot, this is kind of an ugly slide, but I threw together showing we have trainings, we have materials, we have social support through a well, a helpline, I was trying to make it with the warm line at the same time, helpline. Um, they answer, they will respond to voicemails and texts within 24 hours. Um, we have coordinators, which is the program I manage for local coordinators and also specialized coordinators. We have an online support groups. We have, I think there's 40 different online support groups we offer each week, um, a peer mentor program, which is fabulous. Um, we do advocacy and then coming soon, we will be running the um, federal government's new maternal mental health hotline. So it's not the PSI hotline, it's the HRSA hotline, but it's called maternal mental health hotline. And we're excited to, to launch that sometime in the spring. Keeps getting moved, not by us, but that's okay. Um, support groups. Here's a list of all the different support groups. Um, you know, there's so many of these experiences that people often don't feel validated or like that they can't find other people that have had, had those similar experiences and to be able to connect with people across the country that are there with them and understand what's going on makes, can make a world of difference. Um, the support coordinators, this is a map, it's a little bit out of date, but it's pretty close of, uh, coordinators within the state of Texas. So we have them all over the place. Um, specialized coordinators, same thing as the support groups. These are individuals that have specific experience or knowledge in these little niche areas, and it can be enormously impactful to be able to connect with others. Sorry, my time is running slow. Uh, PSI directory.com consultation line. This is for medical prescribers that are not comfortable prescribing medication um, for a pregnant or postpartum individual um, and a bunch of resources. So I'm going to, let's see, stop sharing. And I want to look at the chat and I'm happy to take any questions right now. Let's see. Uh, what did the... Oh, I see. There's a question about um, a new mother was determined to breastfeed. The end result is not being successful. The child is hungry, other specifics, but uh, ooh, yeah, um, church staff is labeling fussy baby. Um, I have told anyone in charge. Um, yeah, so it is really important. Um, there are lactation consultants that can absolutely make a big difference. But the most important thing is to support the parent because if a parent is feeling overwhelmed and stressed, that can very much impact supply and it can make it much harder to have a successful breastfeeding relationship with their baby. Um, so I would recommend, it's, you know, it's up to the baby or sorry, to the parent to make sure that they are doing the right thing for the baby. Um, and that's a tough one. I would definitely, um, and I realize this one is not shown to everybody. So not everybody got to see that question, but I would be happy to kind of consult with you if you'd like. Um, my email address, I will put on here as well, but it's, um, uh, I have like nine email addresses and we're just going to pick this one. So feel free to send this. Um, let's see, any questions? 
Any other questions? Delayed PPD. Let's see, I see a question about um, delayed PPD. I think it hit me nine months out, which surprised me. Um, might've been seasonal. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. It's not, it, there's so many different factors that can come into play and it absolutely can start at nine months. Like it is not just, um, you know, like within a certain, like a small window of time and it can be shocking. And there are doctors out there that will say, oh, you're nine months postpartum. It can't be postpartum depression anymore. You know, here's my soapbox, hard to stay off of it, but there are a lot of OBs that just don't know. We often are encouraged throughout pregnancy, like go to your OB, your OB, your OB, as though the OB is a generalist. And that's not really what they're there for. That's not their training. That's not their skill set. Um, and unfortunately, sometimes they don't know when to say, I don't know. Let me refer you to somebody else who can talk to you about that. Um, also, they're very limited in the amount of time that they can um, they can actually spend uh, with each individual. And that makes it harder as well. Um, let's see, Nami, that's there. Um, baby born in January. So that was October. Yeah, that's it. it and also it can have to do with the stress of like what else is going on and things that are happening. All right, hopefully I answered that question sufficiently. And anybody else? Yes, oh, good question about the perinatal population in the jail system. Ooh, I know they're like, I know GALS is um, the Giving Austin Labor Support is working on, like they do work with some um, pregnant patients in the jail system to give them the extra support. And I think that is phenomenal. I love gals. I think they do some great work. Um, I think that's great. I think um, if there is the opportunity for a support group for parents to be able to connect, I will say this is anecdotal, but um, um, a colleague of mine used to do a support group in a jail system here. And I don't know which one or, or which jail or where, where it was, but um, she said that she had so many attendees of a support group that she was doing for substance use she had so many members that were in there that she would always, they would kind of talk about like, well, where did this all start? And a lot of times it had to do with childhood trauma or, you know, they, it was kind of traced all the way back. But she said that um, a very large number of the actual use began during the postpartum period. And it may have been marijuana. It may have been drinking. Like they were feeling really anxious and stressed. And so they, you know, chose to try to self-medicate with those, those substances and that it just kind of perpetuated itself from there. And so if we can get the care and we can get the support to the individuals that are struggling before they feel like they need to self-medicate and use these other means, we could, you know, kind of stop that process. And, you know, that intervention could, could affect generations and, and other, you know, of not just them, but their children and, and others. Um, let's see resources, bereavement. Yes. Mental health and bereavement in the NICU. That's such a hard one. Um, so locally, uh, there is a support group that is, I, ew, I don't know if it's still meeting at the Ronald McDonald house, but it was through, um, the center for grief and loss. Um, I, I would actually, I recommend looking at the PPHA website because we have a, we have, we do our best to have all the support groups listed there. Um, there are, and Hand to Hold is a really great resource as well. They do have sections for bereavement. Um, PSI does have support groups for perinatal loss. So pregnancy and infant loss. And those are fantastic. Um, we're very picky. Our, the people that run the support groups, they have to have lived experience themselves. They can't just, you know, oh, I'll do that group. Like, I'm not going to do the Black Moms Matter group. That's not my you know, I don't fit in that category and I, I wouldn't be able to support them appropriately. So, but I can do the NICU group. Um, so I, I recommend that as well. Yes, the, Chris, the Christie Center is listed on there too. It has support groups as well. Um, NICU, I mean, the experience at the NICU, I just want to share this too. Um, a lot of times parents, it doesn't hit them until they get home. Um, so during the NICU, that's the time when we can kind of catch them and say, Hey, come like, I remember when mine was at St. David's Maine, you know, they had notes and they would say, okay, we're going to have a parent coffee and come hang out and talk. Well, I had a toddler at home and my time to visit was very limited. I didn't have time to stay and have a coffee. I needed to go pick them up for, from, you know, preschool and take them home and get on with our day. Um, and also I just wasn't really ready to deal with it right there. Um, but once the baby gets home, that's when a lot of times 
I, I call it the, uh, the NICU poop hits the fan. And that's when we start to like the stress response starts to, to kind of settle. And that's when it really starts to hit us what we've gone through. And that's when it can be especially helpful to connect with other people. Um, and along with that too, is a lot of times there's, um, we might hear things like, you know, like, oh, well, the baby's home now, so everything's fine. Or, you know, if there was the experience of like a high-risk pregnancy or um, an emergency C-section, a lot of times the platitudes that are thrown out, like, oh, well, at least everybody's okay now, so everything's fine. That's very dismissive of their experience. And that's very, um, that very much um, goes against providing the validation and the acknowledgement of the experience that they've had. So it's really important just to listen to that person. That's my biggest biggest takeaway is listen to the person and their experience and acknowledge that what, you know, even if you've had your own experience, that that person's experience may be totally different. Um, what else? Oh, the delayed PPD. So somebody said, I thought delayed PPD wasn't PPD. Well, it depends on who tells you that, you know, um, there are going to be, there are OBs that will tell their patients like, oh, you know, you're further along after your baby's so old, this can't be postpartum depression. But again, I have, I have absolutely talked to, to parents who, you know, especially like, I mean, we're talking four or five years postpartum where it is, it meets the criteria. It's related to um, breastfeeding. It's related to like, like abrupt weaning and the, um, the experience is very similar. And so for those of us that do this work, it counts. And we, we totally, to us, it fits and we'll, you know, we'll work with them and see what, how we can help support them. All right. I think Rebecca is here now, so I will hand off to her. Okay, I don't want to rush you, Melissa, just in case. I mean, it's not noon just yet. We have about a minute left. Uh, <laughs> but I just, I, I want to thank everybody for um, attending this afternoon uh, to listen to Melissa. And I uh, just want to remind everybody about saving the date for March 17th, my matter, um, what that's going to be provided by Austin Child Guidance Center. So thank you so much for your time. Um, today, and we, I hope you found this information, this session to be informational. Thank you for having me.